We hate farmers. So, we're here to talk today about this new Farmers Guild. Y'all gonna learn today why we named this the Rage Quit Wire. <laughs> because I am sick and tired of these damn farmers. We've had a number of games with these farmers already. Uh, by the way, I'm Chris Ewan, and this is... We got Pete here too, who loves playing the farmers. Yep. And we've had a couple games here recently that just piss me off. Um, I'm going to warn you right now, you're going to get a great breakdown of the farmers in this episode, but you're also going to hear me bitch a lot about <laughs> <laughs> why this guild is OP as all hell. So um, the two games that I want to reference that we're going to bring back into this are one game that Pete and I played with an honor versus Grange matchup where I played honor and the other one was a Thresher versus Ox matchup. Okay, so do you want to we'll start with the Masons one first. Do you want to say what you brought? Yeah, so I believe what I brought in that game was Honor. I brought Brick and the Monkey so that I could get the counter charges. I brought Tower. I brought Flint, I believe. Yeah, you had Flint in there. And Harmony? Yeah, you, you had the sister in there. Yeah, okay. So th that's what I brought on that game. And then I had Grange, because I, I like Grange a lot, even though there's a lot of love for Thresher. Peck, I had Harrow, Jack Straw, I had Tater, and Windle. Okay, so here's how this game broke down. Pete uh, decided to get Grange up in there pretty quickly. And basically what I was doing is I was trying to, it was turn one and I was trying to get some momentum for turn two to go first. And all he had was Flint left. So I figured that I could get up in there, get a bunch of momentum and that Flint wouldn't cause too many problems for me. But then Chris got smart. Okay. So Flint ends up scoring on turn one. I got the ball first. That's pretty normal. Nothing abnormal there. Um, Grange was overcommitted a little bit, not nothing crazy, but enough to where I could get in there. And you won, I, you won the roll off to go on turn one. I, I or did. Turn two, I, mean. I did. And Honor gets in there. She does work. Ends up deleting Grange. Who had? I had a full stack on him. So serves you right. <laughs> and then the rest of the Masons end up taking out Tater. So I'm up at this point eight zero. And from there, that game was a landslide victory that I could find no way to win. Jack Straw gets the ball. He's bouncing all over the, the backfield. And meanwhile, all of my models and, you know, with those Masons, they're mostly one inch reach, are engulfed by these two inch reach overpowered yeah so let me i'll kind of explain farmers. how i tried to recover from this so i was in a bad way down eight to zero i lost my captain and how i ended up recovering from that is i basically took Wendell, harrow the rooster and i basically decided to kind of withdraw to my own corner so i, I played on my half of the pitch and basically my idea was that if i'm going to get back in it i gotta kind of start grinding out victories or grinding out um, takeouts. So basically I held onto the ball with Jack Straw and my goal was just to keep it away from him. So I would teleport from one side to the other depending on where his strikers were coming at. And then as I brought in, you know, Grange back and as I brought in Tater, basically I just, I kind of started putting them back into the scrum, healing up because farmers heal a ton. And as he started committing more and more Masons, I just started getting ticked. Uh, takeouts. Grange was in there being a jerk. His legendary screwed over Chris, I'm pretty sure, in that because he wanted to do some knockdowns, but he couldn't because Grange's legendary gives everybody within 630. And from that point on, I was up on influence and momentum because I was starting to get my harvest markers going. And once we get into the end part of this podcast, I'll talk to you about how um, those harvest markers are definitely important and how to place them. 
And basically, I grinded my way back into it, and I think I ended up kicking in the winning goal with um, with the Scarecrow. And I think that's basically how that went. I just kept taking a model away. You couldn't drop anybody because I kept healing with Tater, taking um, basically just healing with Harrow, and just taking out your models pretty effortlessly with the Grange Wrecking Crew. Yeah, it was incredibly frustrating knowing how Pete plays those farmers, realizing that I'm up 8-zip, and that there's no way that I'm going to be able to win. It just pissed me off. So let's fast forward to today, this afternoon. Yeah, because we got more current details on this because we just played it today. Literally probably about, I don't know. A few five, hours ago. Yeah, like yeah, five hours ago. So this time Pete wants to get Thresher on the board. And Thresher, we just ordered some of those Halloween models. And so Pete's wanting to get Thresher out there and start getting some practice in with him. So he brings a Thresher list that's brand new to him. I decide, okay, I'm going to bring my butcher list, the classic butcher list that I bring all the time. And what's in that? It's ox, truffles, boar, boiler, meat hook, and shank. I try to include some two-inch reach in there. I know that ox is going to buff up the damage that these guys can do. We start playing this. Well, let me get my crew in there. All first. right. So I had Thresher, and like he said, it's the first time I played him. I've read about him a lot, but it's the first time I played him. I brought the Donkey Buckwheat, I brought Harrow, Jackstraw, Tater, and I brought Grace. So, you want to go ahead and start? Yeah, not that it matters who he brings, because you could literally shake up in a bag and draw or draw names out of a hat. It's not true. What you take with those models, and it just wouldn't matter. They're just going to blow you off the board. So, I bring these Butchers, I set it up, Grace gets a little bit overextended, uh, actually not. Grace was still on your side of the pitch. It was and you mark target. Or... I mark target. I start pushing with meat hook. Take uh, take her out at Grace at the end of turn one. And I go first. Well, you, you missed the part where Thresher moved up and took out meat hook turn one. Okay. Well, either way. We were even 2-2 two, two at the... So we're, we're even, but I'm way up on, on the momentum. momentum and I decide to... Go first. And I'm thinking, this is going to be great. The problem is, as I bring, I have to decide, well, who do I bring in here at this point into the fray, so to speak? Because Tater's countercharge is live. Tater's countercharge is ridiculous. He's basically got eight inches in either direction, which means that it's the equivalent of a 17 plus inch bubble that he's able to influence around that board. And so anytime you set him up anywhere near the middle of the board, that t that that reach is there. And for everyone that thinks, well, it's just counter charge. There are other models that have counter charge. The difference is they don't have the Mow down. type of reach <laughs> or the effects that Tater do. Or that Tater does, excuse me. Sorry. I'm, how we I'm do. Just this is how we do in the South. Oh, I'm just pissed. So... What we're looking at here is I decide to bring in Boiler and knowing that I might trigger the counter charge, which I do. Unfortunately, Boiler and Ox aren't five inches apart, which is the only way that the mowdown isn't going to affect them. So he brings Tater in, knocks down Boiler, knocks down Ox. I have no momentum. And from there, it's just taking out models left and right. Ox goes, Boiler goes. They're having full stacks on yeah, them. Yeah, so, because you couldn't activate after that. So I just, I walk up with Thresher. I do his Don't Fear the Reaper. And then I go ahead and just basically smack the crap out of um, Ox and Boiler, who both had pretty big stacks on them. I think they might actually both have full. Yeah. So, basically, the way this game ends is Pete's able to collect way too many takeouts for what is reasonable. And even though I've got him in a scrum in the middle of the field with Ox there, it just doesn't matter. I can't do enough damage considering all the healing that he does and how many damn boxes those farmers get for me to be able to take out enough models even though you would think well butchers ox they should be able to do a lot of damage and take out a bunch of models the bottom line here and let's just 
say this as simply as possible is these farmers are about as balanced as a seesaw with a fat kid on one end because they aren't. I understand that they have some complexity that requires some synergy, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend them for new players. However, if you're an experienced player and you know how to activate and you're playing that chess game where you're thinking ahead, you shouldn't be losing with these farmers against other guilds. There are a few matchups that might be unique, but for the most part, these guys are going to be winning on influence and momentum every single turn. And because of these crazy overpowered models with all the reach in the world, I, I, I feel like there are times where even when I get initiative, it's pointless because I might as well just let you go first because that's the type of effect. So that. here's how the game ended up finishing just so we can wrap up that game. Basically, I ended up stealing the ball back and kicking it to the Scarecrow after I got up 8-2. I think it was 8-4 to because you took out Harrow as well. You, you were able to drag him away from the scrum and, and take him out. And it's just one of those things where... It, the farmers have a lot of good reaction pieces and a lot of good reaction they can do. The best example I can give you is that Chris did a good job of setting up Tater to get destroyed by Ox. He had Ox with a full stack that just came on the board and he pulled um, or pushed Tater up into his charge range and I was engaged so really I couldn't move out of there except for Tater has mow down. So what I did is I just like, okay, well, I'm gonna attack your little three zero model over here that's easy to hit. And then I got a three, knocked down the models that I was engaged with and walked away. And Chris called me a pussy for it, but it saved Tater. Yeah, but, way to just walk off. Yeah, and so he took out Harrow. I ended up coming in, I took out Boar. I ended up taking out, um, who did I take? I took out Boiler again. I think I took out Meat Hook. And then I finished the game by taking out Shank. Uh, the reason why Chris had a hard time is because once it got to eight to four, I had the ball on Jack Straw and he could not, he had initiative, but he couldn't just leave the ball there. He had a perfect opportunity to probably come in and use his legendary, but he couldn't because he had to react to the ball. So I knew that I was safe as far as that went. He came and took the ball and then I think I was able to kill, I can't remember who I was able to kill too. Um, kind of mitigate what he was trying to do. It was just, it, it was really tough for him. And it was probably about as close to rage quitting as I've seen Chris get in a while. It's just ridiculous. Like, you could honestly play that team that you put on the board today against my full set of butchers, and you could have played them two models down. You could have not even had Haro or Grace on the board, and you still would have won. <laughs> this team is just ridiculous. And. I recognize that a lot of people are going to be listening to this and they're going to say, well, we've played the farmers. They don't seem that overpowered. Well, I'll throw down the gauntlet right now. As soon as Pete gets his second farmer's box, anybody that can beat Pete's farmers, <laughs> bring it on because we'll invite you onto the podcast and you can tell us what fools we are and how we're idiots because if you can beat Pete's farmers, I take my hat off to you because I've been trying and... I've given it all sorts of different combinations and it just does not work for me because of how Pete activates these. So let's talk a little bit and I'll ask you. I want to throw yeah. one caveat out, caveat out there real quick. Just um, so just so people don't think they're like, oh, well, butchers don't do great because of the reach and the knockdown and stuff. That That's not it. We played this actually a lot and Chris and I own almost like all the guilds. And we even put matchups that are bad for farmers out there, and they still come out on top. And it's not overly difficult for me to 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 do that either. And I'm not saying I'm the best player in the world, but this guild is good. Even though I love my brewers, I mean, I can say that I, I do a lot more work with these farmers. So go ahead. With we've tried saying. to meta list these things. Like yeah. we've tried to put together hunters lists. We've tried to put together morticians lists that are designed to beat these guys and we're having a tough time when they're played correctly or what we perceive as them being played correctly. Uh, just to let you know, this has gone the other way too. For the most part, Pete plays these farmers, but at one point I picked them up and we were playing against the engineers, yeah, I engineers. and I went up three zip 
and Pete said, this is over. The, he could see the writing on the wall, and we called that game at 3-0, knowing there was no way for those. At this point, I have, I have the ball, and Pete knows there's no way that he's going to be getting it. Yeah, I had a gun line, basically a ballista line, and I there was no way I could get a model in there without going through your scrum, even with velocity, and it was just... The way it was set up, it, you were playing with enough, enough discipline not to overextend yourself. So, yeah, that game was done at 3-0, in my opinion. So, let's talk about general farmers' concepts. What attracted you to the farmers? What are the things that you think are unique about them that made them attractive to you? Well, the first thing that I liked when there was a farmers' guild, first off, I was I kind of grew up in my early youth as you know a farmer like my parents owned a farm if you go you go into my house you see like the sign that was like outside my farm so that that's just one I'm kind of one of those guys where I like ideas that you know I can relate to like that and then the second thing is I started seeing the models and I think these plastic models that came out the sculpts are really clean on them a lot of people were worried about painting them but they paint up real nice and I, I think Steamforge did a real good job on putting that box together with the tokens and everything in it and then I started looking at not just the sculpts, but then kind of reading about the play style and the background of them. So the fluff is awesome because Steamforge does a superb job of relating the fluff to how they play in the game. So like we're talking about like mow down and, you know, don't fear the reaper and all this stuff. And it relates perfectly to the fluff because if you read it in season three book, they talk about how they're flailing around and they're hitting each other because they're so undisciplined. So I love that the rules kind of reflect that. And it's just, there. I love the harvest markers. I love how you set up the team and how it's all kind of like just this giant chess kind of game that you're trying to win and that you have to set up correctly because they're so fragile with basically nobody having armor with the exception of like Millstone. And um, it's just... It's one of those things where I just, I really liked it when I started reading and looking at it. Yeah, so what are some of the unique rules here that people need to be aware of, specifically as it relates to these harvest markers? Yeah, so the first thing that you need to know is that the two different types, and I know people have done their take on this, but I think we got a lot of insight on and a lot of games, and I've probably played probably a couple dozen games with the farmers now. And the two big mechanics are, first off, you have reapers and planters. Planners are the ones... Reapers and sowers. Sorry, sowers. Thank you. So sowers, but they're planters. So the sowers are the ones that are going to put all your harvest markers down. They're the ones that, you know, you're going to um, basically get those down and they're going to generally do something to benefit the group. Whereas the reapers, they literally cannot do anything without the... Not anything, but they are superbly better when you have those harvest markers down. The difference between a reaper without any harvest markers next to them and one with it is very, very different. So you want to take advantage of, if you don't see a harvest marker near those reapers, like Thresher, like Tater, like Windle, you want to take advantage of that situation quickly because I can guarantee that there's a planter or a sower coming in, you know, and trying to get that set up as soon as possible. And then the second mechanic, are those harvest markers you can run or trample through them and generally chris and i we hear that's the big argument well why don't you just run over their harvest markers but i think a good farmer player can really mitigate where you can where you can take care of that and in order to do that you're basically against a good farmer's player having to waste an activation just running a guy around well, and you can't. Most people can't afford to just waste their activations running a model around just to take out harvest markers. You need to run a model to get someplace to attack or whatever. It well, might be. not only that, Chris, but you know by now the way I play is that usually if everything goes the way I want it to go, or even if it doesn't, I'll still usually hold off. My sowers are going towards the end of the turn. Like I'm going to wait to usually my last two or three activations. To put those down and I'm not going to put them in a spot where it's convenient for you. I'm going to put them where it's like if you want to go run those over it's going to either take you out of the game or it's going to put you right where I want you. Yeah it's it's just frustrating. The other aspect is you can pick those markers up 
and get influence. So it feels like you're always up on influence in order to put the markers down. In many cases, you're generating momentum to put them down. So you feel like you're always up on momentum, always up on influence. This is a guild that I feel has a characteristic where, and I've attributed this to other models in the past, the idea that they just have one too many abilities or one too many options. And we'll go through these individual players and talk about some of their characteristics. And I think that as I point some of these things out, you'll see what I mean by they just have one too many options or yeah, one too many A abilities. good example of the harvest marker thing was that Chris was going first, so he put his influence down, and this was turn four of the game we played today. And I had two harvest markers pretty close to his scrum. And usually it's like, okay, well, maybe a farmer player will leave those down, but that would be moronic in my opinion. So I pulled those suckers up, got the two influence, because Chris could have easily taken Shank and like ran over both of them and attacked um, I think the scarecrow is over there, but that's what I'm saying is like I think if a farmer's player is intelligent enough and knows how to manage those harvest markers, it's not going to be beneficial for anybody to go run over those ever if they're placed correctly. Yeah, so they just get free buffs throughout the game to their models and free influence when they want to pick up the harvest markers. Yeah, that's that's what it means. So let's talk about these two captains. What are your thoughts on Grange first, and then we'll talk about Thresher. So, at first, so I've, I've played, like to, like we said, today was my first game of Thresher. I've read a lot about him, I saw, I've seen some battle reports, and when I was going into this, I was like, I like Grange a lot, I don't know if I'm going to play Thresher as much as everybody else does, and I think that's probably still true, but man, Thresher impressed me today. So I'll start with Thresher just because of our, you know, game today. Okay. So he is a very flexible captain that can basically, with the support of some sowers, do a lot of damage. He can also get the ball to places you, you know, you want. He could actually be a pretty good scorer. So the thing that's probably really ridiculous on him is the three-inch reach. He's basically a captain version of Mallet. He also has a lot of momentum on a lot of damage. I mean, he has a momentous four at the end of his playbook, and he's tax seven, and if you're knocked down and stuff, it's not that hard to get there. He also gets a free three damage, basically, because you're going to have a harvest marker down somewhere for him to use, and that's three damage that everybody's taking if they're in his melee range. And he's just... He's, so he's so let's, put, let's put this in perspective. At the end of his playbook which is only six it's six columns long. Yeah. He's got four momentous damage, and any time he wants, he can hand out another three damage, and you can put a max influence of five on him. Yeah. So let's compare that to Ox. In comparison, Ox can get to four momentous damage, but he has to get seven hits on seven tag uh, instead of six hits on seven tag. I think tag. that's deceiving because he has the owner. That That's fine. So but he, he, gets... he still has he still has five influence, so that's the same. He is not able to just hand out a three damage it, unless you're talking about through the owner or through yeah, the legendary yeah. play, which I can understand. I can understand what you're saying there, but it's harder to hit Thresher with that four defense. And let's not pretend that the one armor that Ox gets balances is it there? out because it doesn't. Yeah. And Thresher, by the way, we didn't even bring this up because this didn't even come up in the game. He's a 3-8 kick. Yeah. So this guy can kick. He can hand out all sorts of damage. He's got way more reach than Ox by about two inches because of that extended reach. And then you have his legendary. And then you have his legendary where he gets to hand out more tack and get life drinker to heal some more. It's not like it's enough that he already has 20 <laughs> fucking boxes on him. So, and by the way, that life drinker goes out to all of the other models in the guild the that are within the, within the pulse. Yeah, and the plus tack. It, it's just ridiculous that he's... It, there are things that he doesn't even need to use and he's overwhelming. For yeah. example... 
the scything march, which allows him to take a one inch dodge with every knockdown oh, model. Knockdown. So you knock the models down, and then you keep getting to extend the reach. It's not enough that he's already got an eleven inch threat. It goes to twelve or thirteen. Oh and yeah, so and then I love his four, his momentous four result, the two damage, and the they ain't tough. So basically, you do two damage, and you say you don't have armor anymore. Yeah, the so he's already handing out tons and tons of damage. And he's got, he can negate the armor. So if you're thinking, oh, well, at least I still have my armor. Nope, you don't. <laughs> because he's able to choose results that not only do damage well, Chris, and generate momentum gotta, and take your armor away. All you away. gotta do is counterattack him. Yeah, that's all you gotta do. Because you can counterattack a three inch reach model <laughs> when you have two inch reach so or one inch how, reach. Let me ask you this how long do you think they're gonna keep him three inch reach? They should nerf him now before they even release that damn box. This is ridiculous. Well, so he's good, but I think if you take away that three inch reach, I think he becomes more. You can deal with him easier. Oh, by the way, just in case anyone's wondering, you also get a free counter attack if you're within four inches of a harvest marker. Yeah, that didn't come up today either. That didn't come up today. It, it's just. This is ridiculous. So they need to tone down something. You could honestly take away. A couple of things at least take something away extend his his playbook out to seven results or you know shrink down his kick or at least like something so, to make this guy reasonable if you want to make him a three inch reach model if that's a captain i understand why that might be something you need for a captain to do although i think that it makes him pretty strong but then at least like stretch back his movement or something he's an eight inch movement on a run or a charge 11 this is, this is just, uh, I hate these guys. All right, so then I have Grange, and Grange is, I like Grange a lot more because I think I can do some cooler things with Grange. I think Thresher's just a little overpowered, but Grange, I actually like where he is. I think that, yeah, he's tough to deal with, but I, I don't... I bet you do like where he is because now you're going to hear me talk about how Grange is actually better than Thresher. Go can ahead. I, can I talk about him? Yeah, go ahead. Can, can, I, tell, tell can us. I finish? Yep, can I finish? go ahead. All right. So my Grange list right now that I've been running, and I love this list a lot because it's almost all the two-inch reach, is Grange. I run him with Peck. I run that with Harrow, Jackstraw, Tater, and Windle. Fuck you, Internet. I love Windle. So <laughs> Windle and Grange are BFFs. So Grange is awesome because he's attack six. Probably the thing I love most about him, though, is that he has that sexy knockdown no menace on one. So I've been known to go into our meta and go into a scrum, and I, I usually, not going to lie, I usually activate Grange first or second just because I like him as a setup piece that goes against all the sower or the planner mechanics. So it's one of those things where you don't, I don't usually activate my planners till later, but... Grange, I think, is the setup piece that you got to act up or you got to activate. Yeah, because he early. sets up all the other models. So, first off, he has six influence. He brings six influence each turn because he brings five and then he can put a harvest marker down. So, it's six. It may say five, but it's six. You can give him six, and I usually load him up pretty close to full. And, like I said, I, my goal with him is to knock down as many models as I can, get honest labor up. Usually, I want to do that through the playbook so I get momentum. And then I put down a harvest marker where it's useful, usually next to Windle or Tater. And then after that, really, I always save one to put Constitution up. And I put that on the model that I think the other player can get to or that is in danger. So let's say Chris is about to think he's going to delete Tater or maybe he's going to come into Windle hard. I'll put Constitution on them, which is, for those of you who don't know, Tough Hide. And I'll put it on them so it's harder for him to delete a model. So that, yeah, I'm 2-0 with Windle or I'm 4-0 with Tater or 3-0 with Grange. But, hey, I got 26 boxes and I'm tough hide. So good luck getting through that in one activation because I'm going to heal next turn. So I love that. Honest Labor is real good. Um, his Legendary I have used to screw over so many people. Mainly because... You don't get knocked down, so then you got to deal with that counterattack from the farmers, which isn't always good. And then I also do something nifty where I use his legendary because you get two harvest markers that you can throw up the pitch six inches. And I use that to put Tater back online with his counter charge. I use that to put it next to Windle. 
And sometimes I'll even use it to set up a score with Jack Straw. So if Jack Straw has got the ball, I'll put a couple harvest markers out his way so he can jump to him and then score his eight inch goal. So Grange is my favorite captain, definitely. Yeah, I can see why because he's he's stronger than Thresher. I don't I I don't understand where there's a weakness here. Grange is basically whoever designed this at Steamforge said, "Hey, you know, our two two of our best melee captains are Vet Rage and Tapper. So, let's take the strengths of both of those captains and put them into one model." So you can have early momentous knockdowns, even earlier than Tapper gets. Yeah, Tapper's on two. And put out all of the supporting aura, basically, that Tapper does. And then, and have the two-inch reach that Tapper does. And then in addition to that, we're going to add the things that Rage can do, where you're doing, you know, plus damage and tack. And um, in his case, he's even reducing the number of tack if he's one of the intervening Crowding models. Crowding out models, yeah. Yeah. The, it, he's able to do almost everything. He the almost only forces thing he you can't to attack do, him. Yeah, the, he, he absolutely forces you to attack him. And the only thing that he can't really do is be able to push his own movement up. So at least if there's one semblance of sanity with <laughs> what was created with this model, at least they made him a seven inch run or charge and he can't go more but I don't will, get I will me wrong there's not a, there you can use other models to get i him will say this more. though tapper is a four seven he's a five seven so technically he's a little faster than tapper. oh great yeah because that's what he needs throwing that out this... there all right so these are the two overwhelming captains that they... oh by the way and let's lest we forget he also generates five influence on his own because well, that's what, it's captains six. just it's, do that. It's six. What do you mean six? Well, because he puts a harvest marker down and you pull that up at the beginning. Okay, of the I get what you're saying. So, uh, great. You know, <laughs> as opposed to all the other captains that get like four. Three, some of them. Or three, some of them. Yeah, it's just insane. Okay, let's break down some of these. What are your thoughts on the mascots? I recognize that you feel like they each kind of have their place depending on who you're playing. Um, you're gonna you're gonna see buckwheat most of the time. I'd say the only time you really see the roosters against um, condition teams, probably mostly hunters and uh, brewers. Definitely. Besides that, I don't think there's... alchemists. Eh, maybe. Okay, so so pet can be used. I don't. With conditions. I don't think alchemists because I think you can outheal their condition damage. Of course you can. Yeah. <laughs> so buckwheat why are you going to take him most of the time uh just because you saw i almost lined it up just the four inch push he gets when he gets an attack next to a harvest marker that can potentially knock you off the board uh he has early knockdowns too which is great and then yeah momentous ones on two yeah and like tapper oh no he does get the four inch push just for doing an attack that's not near a harvest marker it's the free attack if he's next to a harvest marker. Yeah, free attacks. Yep, Great. We play yep. that. We play yeah, that. He role. should. He should have that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, he's a good mascot. He doesn't bring any influence to the table, but everything he can choose except for the top is momentous. So that's definitely good. Okay. So let's move down here. Uh, Bushel has some limitations. And we'll, I think we, we won't really get into we her. We both agreed that the only time we like her is like into Flint. Well, any, close, anybody close has control. close control, so yeah. you'll you might take her against a engineers engineers type thing. Yep. Okay. okay. So Haro, let's talk about what he does. Oh man, I think a lot of farmers have classified him as like an auto include, and I'm, I kind of agree with that. Just because of tooled up is nice to put out there. Uh, if you set it up right, you should get a free influence or a free uh, harvest marker from him every turn if he's next to the captain where he should be. He has uh, sow the seeds, which is great because if you find yourself behind on your harvest markers, he can come up and do a couple of attacks and put down some more harvest markers. And then probably this is what I was talking about with the alchemist not being too big of a problem is that he heals everybody within six inches, uh, two hit points at the, during the maintenance phase. Oh, so they can heal extra. That's that. Well, yeah, we already awesome. agreed that they do a bunch of healing. Yeah, yeah, and and, and have plenty of boxes. And he's two inch reach. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so he gets to he gets to run up and sow the seeds, which generates momentum. By the way, not only is it going to yeah, give you momentous. more influence on the next turn because you pull the harvest markers up, it also generates momentum on two hits. Yep. So that's great. It is. 
All right, Jack Straw. Jack Straw is probably my favorite model to use in the game, just because I can do a lot with Jack Straw. Early on in the game, I use him for getting two um, harvest tokens out. Almost every, actually every turn, I always put two on him. Okay. Usually I'll throw three on him, but it's at least two. And that's because crop dusting gives you two, uh, two harvest markers every turn. He also gets to jump four, and he's placed. So he jumps four inches to a harvest marker, and then you can pay one to jump to another harvest marker. He has a 2-8 kick, so it doesn't take him a lot to get into range. He has a 2-inch reach. He tackles momentously on one, and he has a knockdown. Oh, and by the way, is it easy to hit this guy? I mean, if you count five zero as being yeah, easy okay, to hit. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, what, what about trying to kill him? Is, is, I would imagine he's a scarecrow, so you must be able to kill him easily, right? Yeah, yeah, he's he only has ten hitboxes. Yeah, and then fucking reanimate. This is this guy's bullshit, and he just pops and poofs all over the who, field. Who coined the pop and, pop and poof? That was me in a, a a rage moment as we drove back from Myrtle Beach. This guy's popping and poofing all over yeah, the place. Yeah, just pop and poof. Yeah, he's I just think, gone. I think we've kind of set it up where, like, if we did max, kind of like in a perfect world, not, it's not even that hard to set up. But basically, he could have. Like a four, eight, that's, uh, let's see here, and then four. So, I mean, he has close to like a 20-inch goal threat. I think it's more than that. Yeah. Because you have to consider, you have to be four inches away from the marker, but then you get to set on the opposite yeah, side your of base that. size. So, you're talking about the width of that that marker, which is a 30 millimeter, and, I think, and then the width of his base as I well. Think, see, and he can do that, so that score is there, that's in your pocket. But I think where people need to use Jack Straw specifically is just to kill the ball. Like, I think he's perfect for killing the ball because if you come towards him, next thing you know, I'm poofing and popping all over the place, you know, 14 inches or whatever back the other direction. Yeah, so the way that I see you use Jack Straw a lot is kill the ball because he's so hard to hit and... He can just jump all over the board, and you can never be in a good spot to attack him. And then seal it with a with a oh yeah a I'm, goal I'm, at the I'm, end. I'm going for basically four takeouts in one goal. He is easily the best scorer, not from the standpoint of his two eight kick, but from the standpoint of him being able to line up scores that no other model in the well, game can line it's up. So, he's such a good non-linear threat. Yes, like exactly. He is good at, like, oh, there's, like, this slight, you know, I can put a harvest marker just right into his four inches, and then I can place another one four inches out, and next thing you know, he's got a goal. Okay. Millstone. Uh, Millstone's good. I haven't played her yet. I'm going to wait probably for her to come out in the new box. Um, she's going to replace Grace in my Thresher list, though. I can already see it because she brings just as much influence, and she's a farmer. She has a great playbook. She also has a 3-2 defense and armor, so that's really good. And she pushes her team two inches directly away when she goes base-to-base -base contact with them. And uh, she also is guaranteed to put a harvest marker out. So, I mean, Grace is good, but she doesn't give you any of that. And then... The, probably the coolest thing she does is that if she's within six inches of a model, she can take that condition away from that model when they get it. So if you knock somebody down, she can fall over instead somehow six inches away. That's, yeah. So I know you're looking forward to playing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wendell, we're, we're going to skip Tater for now because Tater is the coup de grace of this guild. So let's talk about Wendell. So Wendell, people, and even Steamforge just said they wanted to see how good they could make a model but also how bad they could make a model at the same time and they came up with Wendell and I think if you are really creative Wendell is going to win you games and even if he's a liability he can do so much output that it's just worth bringing him not with um, not with Thresher I don't think he's in a Thresher list at all but with Grange definitely I'm bringing him 90% of the time. Maybe not in a couple matchups that I've had problems with. I'm not going to share those matchups. And we'll share that in the news later. But I bring him a lot. And here's why I like him. Because if, especially if him and Grange are on the same target with Honest Labor, that model's dead. So first thing is that I'm going to share with Wendell is that his whole stop slacking thing gets him into so many melee scrums. 
Like people are like, oh, he's only a three five. You're gonna have to run him. It's like, no, I'm not because I'm going to get four inches of dodge somewhere. So after turn one, he's going to be generally where I want him to be. So that's really good. Big breakfast, giving him a free influence and plus two tap because he's gonna be next to all those sexy harvest markers that I set up. And the other thing I love about him, of course, is the Berserk. He's gonna have three attacks, and he's going to get six because he's going to Berserk. And he's tack seven. If he's next to Grange, he's gonna be tack nine. And he has only a playbook of six. Wait, this, so you're talking about tack seven with the- With Honest breakfast. Labor up. Okay, Because Big Breakfast plus, and Honest Labor, yeah. okay. Because that's what, that's what you're gonna set up. And it's not that hard to set up. The only time that, and I have no problem sharing this, the way you get around having him tack nine with uh, Honest Labor is you push Grange away from the scrum a little bit, and that takes care of it. But Wendell's still good, especially if there's a mascot nearby. You're going to snack break that some bitch every time because instead of getting one point for the mascot, you're going to get two points for the mascot. And with six influence, that's not hard to do. And a lot of times people look at this guy, they see limited movement, they see a five tack, so they don't think it's anything special, not realizing all the ways that you're going to boost that up. Two defense, no armor, doesn't generate any influence each turn, and they think, well, that's a limitation. It really isn't, especially when you have all the influence you could well, possibly need. Because usually you're going to have to get through Tater and and Grange before you get to Windle. Like, a a person who doesn't know what they're doing will put Wendell out in front. That's not where you want him. You want to move the team in front of him, kind of like what the way you play Boar. You want your team in front of him, and each time you want to be four inches away, so he moves an inch each time you move somebody next to him. Next thing you know, he's four or five inches up the pitch, then he can jog three, and then he has two-inch reach. So he has 10-inch threat each turn. So it, it really doesn't matter if you try to stay out of him because chances are he's going to sneak his way up and get in your shit. Yeah. And unless you think it's worth taking him out, let's not forget that on the back side of his card, he also has Hale and Hardy. So once he's at 15... You don't get any momentum. 15 hitboxes left. <laughs> so you're still going to have to like hit him another three, four, five times potentially to kill him. You get zero well, momentum for that. And if I notice that you're kind of, you know, you're Jones and after Wendell, and I'll say this, Wendell a lot of times will be my first activation if he's already set up ready to go. Like if you're halfway on hit points, I'm going to activate Wendell and I'm yeah. going, because I'll have a harvest marker next to him. But Wendell, he's one of my targets that I'll throw constitution on to give him tough hide if I think you're going to get. Try to knock. Oh him yeah, out. so then you can be tough hide with twenty eight boxes. Twenty eight boxes, yeah. I've done that before. I mean, I think yeah, I know you have. I've, I've experienced it. <laughs> that Mason game that you got so pissed off at, he was tough hide, and yeah, that didn't. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about Tater, this pretty boy, some bitch. So most people in the that are in farmers or played against him will agree. Tater's probably the MVP a lot of times. Yeah, he's an auto include. So I think I think so too. Either captain, he's great. So he has a long threat. He's threat 10 because he's a 6-8 move with 2-inch reach, like the rest of the guild pretty much. Yeah, yay. Um, mow down is very sexy. That means everybody in his melee range gets knocked down. So you're always setting up to knock down two or three models instead of just one. Uh, he can do that on a party blow too, which is awesome. Uh, let's see here. What else does he have? He has counter charge, which is always great. But make sure that if... And it's tough to deal with, but you got to try to push him away from or pull him away. Corsair would probably be a really good example of being able to pull Tater out of there. So, I mean, that's that's a really good example of how to get away from that. But then also on his charge, he does an extra three damage so to all models in his melee. So that's not one time a turn. That's the counter charge and his tur yeah. charge and his activation. And so as long as you put him within two inches of all these models, they're taking an extra three yeah. multiple times. I just this guy <laughs> and then if he does so tater also is renowned for healing a lot because not only can you heal him for eight you can also heal him for two with harrow and then if you still feel like you're hurt you can heal yourself three more by removing a harvest marker so he can get pretty much from two hit points to full in three activations pretty much yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous. He's tough to kill. And the female characters, they need fives to hit him. So he's just, he's good. He is really good. Yeah, this model absolutely needs to be nerfed. They they need to do, 
they need to take away the mow down or the counter charge. It needs to be one of the two. Because the idea of him being able to counter charge and then mow everything down, that is so ridiculously overpowered. By the way, one thing that doesn't often come up is let's not forget that he also gets to do that stupid mow down on parting blows too. Yeah, I just I said that a second ago. Okay. Sorry, there's so much to process with <laughs> everything this stupid So, guy and do. here's why I think, though, Chris, I think this is why you're going to agree that this is why the farmers probably aren't great, especially for newer players, because there is so much. And it's hard to remember, you know, all the intricacies. It's hard to remember, you know, where to put my harvest token so that these, you know, benefits are live. Whereas me, two dozen games in... I'm like, oh, I'm going to put this, this, and this there. That way I have all these options open. And then when you come in, I can react accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. So these guys already are overwhelming. Let's talk about, I need to talk about two of these guild identity cards because they're just ridiculous. Uh, the first one is Crack of Dawn. I think we agreed. We played, like when you played My Farmers, I think we agreed that this is, Initially, it's good, but then it's kind of meh the rest because obviously it's just the first turn. Yeah, but the nice thing is you take it and it doesn't reduce your your hit point well, or healing. It puts your counter charges live immediately, and it puts a big breakfast live immediately yeah. for one of them. Yeah, so it, it's good, it, it, and you don't really lose anything by taking it. The one that's more impressive is Eat Hardy. <laughs> Because if they make guild identity cards a thing, this is probably what I'm taking almost all the time. Oh yeah, because anytime a model gets taken out, not that they will, because you heal somebody. Good luck. They're gonna heal three extra hit points when they come on, and then if that's not enough, that they're already healing extra when they come back on. You can heal them five. You can heal them five, so they bump up their healing in every area. It's it's just mind boggling. Like it's, I don't know. It's demoralizing because honestly. I've told, the, especially players that, you know, maybe, you know, they're a couple notches below me. I'll tell them that, you know, if you don't delete this model, this activation, it's not worth attacking him because I'll just heal it up. Yeah, I don't know who it was that was excited for this guild and... I was excited for it. Yeah, fine. Well, I guess you're the one that gave a hand job to whoever was playtesting these guys <laughs> because this is ridiculous that they're so OP. I, I wanted to do this podcast, and it's a double-edged sword, because I recognize a lot of people are going to listen to this podcast and say, sweet, let's take a whole bunch of farmers. Please do that. All you great players out there, take a whole bunch of farmers. I want to see them win every tournament under the sun so they can get nerfed into something reasonable <laughs> as quickly as so, possible. Let's talk about that real quick, Chris. What do you think are... We talked about this. What are a couple of things that you think, if they just tweaked it a little bit, Farmers would be in a real good spot. Uh, yeah, so... And we're not talking about big changes. The, there's yeah, the, the biggest one is the idea of any time they interact with those harvest markers, they should have to pull them off. There shouldn't be times where they get to interact with those harvest markers and get bonuses and not pull them off. Two, the harvest markers should cost you influence or momentum. Agreed. It shouldn't be that you're able to have more momentum and more influence and just place. with all of these extra harvest markers. Like, that's mind-boggling to me. And then the last thing is, you've got to suck down some of this ridiculous reach. That's fine. You want Thresher to have 3-inch reach, so he's the only 3-inch reach model that's a captain. That's cool. Like that, that I have no problem with that. But... Having all of them have three inch reach. I think we both have agreed that Jack Straw probably could go to one inch reach. And I think Grange also would be okay at one inch reach. I think that would I think Wendell down. should be at one inch reach. Nah, I mean but Because right now they they make it appear like, you know, he's limited as far as his movement because mm -hmm. of his movement stats, but with the extra movement that he's able to get and the two inch reach, something has to change there because he really is not limited in his movement. For a player that's playing the or maybe maybe make big breakfast, like you said, cost like a, a like almost like a heroic or something. Yeah, fine. That if it was, I would rather it be a heroic. I think you're right. I think there's a lot of benefits and not enough costs for what they do. Because like I've been like that example in the Masons game where Chris knocked out um, knocked out Grange. I had a full stack on him, but after the turn, we were pretty much even on momentum. Because yeah. I, because 
there I had so many I think I pulled up like four harvest markers, so I still was pretty well set on momentum. And then they need to do something about Tater. T- Tater, he just has too many options. He's got too much threat and too too much knockdown with that with that mow down and it, it's just ridiculous. So there needs to be something done about Tater. Tater Tater would be an auto include in almost any guild that they put that model in. So he's not special to the farmers. It's just they made an overpowered model. The last thing that I think we want to talk about before we get to the end of this, because we're getting towards the end of our podcast, and this is running not too much longer than usual, but it's going to go a little bit longer. Uh, just first off, the way I'm going to talk about harvest markers, because we had a couple people asking about like what's a good way to kind of place um, place those. And like I said in the beginning, the key with this is to have your planners go towards the end of the turn. So you do not want all of your planners planning those things down your first, second, or third activation. You want your planners to put them down, usually your second to last or your last activation. That way there's very little reaction time that your opponent can have to them. Because if you put them down first, that gives your opponent five activations to see how they're going to screw you over. With oh, these... and that would be exciting for me because then I get to waste one taking them out of running. I mean, but you know what I'm saying, like, as the turn develops, there would be opportunities that open up sure. that you may not have to waste as much. Sure. But that's what I'm saying. With just one activation left, you're probably not going to get into them. And if you do, like I said, I'm going to put them in a way where if you go towards them, that you're going to end up coming into Tater's Counter Charge or you're going to come into Windle to eat you alive. So it's just providing your, you got to make sure you set them up where your opponent is not going to benefit from running over those. The only model that I've seen that I'm worried about is actually the Armadillo because he can bounce around basically for free. So he's the only model that when I see him on the board, I'm going to try to kill quickly because I don't want him screwing my scrum up. That's alliteration for you. So make sure, like I said, sowers at the end of the turn or planners at the end of the turn. Make sure that you're also setting up in mind for your uh, your reapers to go first on your next turn. So you always want to be like, oh, my planner needs to put one next to Windle, or I need to put one next to Thresher. That way I can activate them first or second and go kill stuff. Well, it, but also remember, the armadillo isn't as scary as you think, because even oh, though know. the armadillo has a lot of movement for free, he only pushes you that doesn't equal a run. Him having the plus two, plus two movement doesn't make that all of a sudden a run instead of a jog. Yeah, he's, he's and so a run though. Yeah, but it, it would at least cost one influence to yeah. do it, and then he would have ten inches of. But I think if you get the armadillo to you know take out two or three harvest markers because he can just roll around, yeah. I think that's worth something. Yeah, it, it it is. It just. It. I know what you're saying. Like you still have to spend that one influence. Yeah. So. Let's shift gears here. What's the update on Union and Chains? So Union and Chains, it's developing really nicely. And I'm very happy, and I know this makes you sad, because... Yeah, just catching L's left and right. Yeah, you're, you just can't win today. Yeah, I feel like the Buffalo Bills playing Tom Brady. Fuck you, man. Fuck <laughs> does that burn? Does that cut you deep? I Good. Does. You know, I don't feel so bad about playing Farmers now. Okay, well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Tell that to all Braves. So the Brewers are winning pretty handedly right now. They're up 65 to 35 against the Mason. So you're not getting your... I want that model so bad. Not getting your Mason Chica there with Decimate. Uh, engineers are getting trashed. They're in the same boat, 62 to 38. So that's beautiful. Um, the other two are dead heats, though. This this is going to be interesting the last couple weeks here. Because uh, fishermen only have forty eight percent, but the butchers have fifty two. So you might want to go ahead and you know get some games in. I know, butchers. I know. We might as well get cutter. And dude, the hunters and the mace, or hunters and masons, hunters and morticians are dead even fifty percent. Yeah. Well, I mean, how exciting for them to get hemlock. Well, like I said, I think the vet hemlock hopefully will be good. And she's not bad right now. Blind's good. Okay. Then she's she's just thing. she's super easy to kill. That's that's all. Yeah. It, it, she'll she'll. I, I guess they're both control teams, and she's a control piece. Uh, they got the new fluff up. I'm not going to spoil any of that, but the fluff's pretty cool if you're not paying attention to them. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I won't get into it. Sure. So check that out. It's all on Steamforge+. Plus, I've also been retweeting a lot of the Steam. Each time they release something, I've been putting it up on our Twitter feed at Rage Quit Wire. so make sure that you check that out. And, yeah, that's pretty much it with the Union Chain. has got a couple, I think it's two weeks left. Is it five weeks or six weeks? I think it's two, two weeks left. 
two weeks. Well, that sounds right. Yeah, I think it's five. Um, so that's really exciting. Either way, get your games in sooner than later. Yeah, I mean, and there's no limit to how many you can play. So I've been doing like two or three a week. Uh, Chris has zero, so fun. I just haven't posted them. I need to post them. Yeah, you have some camera shots. You just yeah, like, it'll, it'll it'll be fun posting some of these farmers games that we played and giving them the feedback. So I think my headline will probably be something like "Doesn't matter how you play, farmers OP." Something else that we're getting into is we've basically been challenged by the Double Dodge guys out in Australia to play some vassal ball with them. So Juan's going to show me how to do some vassal, and I'm going to play some Aussies. Sweet. And another cool thing, if you haven't been on our... Um, Hopefully you knock them out like Alistair Overeem did to Mark Hunt. If you haven't been on our uh, Holy City Arsenal webpage that uh, Juan Martinez designed, if you haven't been on there, we are putting up articles for the guilds. We've got a few on there. We have some general stuff for the guilds we haven't gotten to yet. But one of the Double Dodge guys from Australia is actually going to write up a, um, a how to play Hunters for us. Oh, sweet. Yeah. I don't That'll think, be super I didn't open. think you heard that, but... No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's going to be cool. That'll, that'll be awesome. Because they play them a lot out there in Australia, so we're excited to see what uh, kind of write-up they got for us. Yeah, that'll be neat. So we have a big announcement for you guys. We're very excited about this. It's huge. And so... they. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Joe, go ahead. Joe you have so so big burgers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a good barbecue. Anyways, no, you can say it. You're excited. You need a, you need an upper so, after today. So what Pete and I will be doing come Martin Luther King Day weekend, in weekend. Martin Luther King weekend, excuse me. Up in Milwaukee, there is an American team championship. It's a five man team. There's five, gonna be five man team. Or, excuse me. Three man team, and there will be eight different teams. Is yep. that correct? That's correct. Right. And so we're coming up there, up into the land of ice cold and cheese and cheese to take on the best that the Americas have. Yeah, best the best America has the the Midwest. Yeah, so we're we're making a South Carolina team. So it's going to be Chris and I. Let's and be real. We're coming for Chicago. Let's make it simple and blank. Well, we're. I'm saying it's it's our South Carolina team, and we're going to have a guy from probably one of the Greenville guys be our third. We're trying to work that out right now. Yeah, we're, we'll, we'll we'll have a surprise announcement for who that is, but we've got a a blue chip recruit in the works. Hopefully, we're trying. You know, we're gonna <laughs> we're we're gonna take the Louisville approach and we're going to try to sweeten the pot and you know throw some money his way maybe and try to convince him to come up with some yeah i'm not gonna go further into louisville but you know you know how rick patino operated okay okay i'm not paying for hookers for this guy. <laughs> i just want him to come play some guild ball let's not get crazy let's, let's not listen this is not that real let's yeah let's not get into it but i i'm very excited i know that there are great players and great teams up there I want to go at it with them. So, win so, or lose. So so far, let's throw down. It's I know that the the Chicago Meta I think has two games or two teams already. There's a team from Iowa that they're getting together, and then I think there's also a team from Missouri that they're going to bring up as well. And that's all I know so far. And we already got a spot reserved, so there's a South Carolina team. Dope. Yeah. So this about wraps it up. This go round for us. The we did want to give a shout out to our wonderful sponsor, Final Round Game Shop. Jacob, thank you very much for everything you do to support Guild Ball and to support us in our yeah, gaming. I'm gonna give out a shout out just to him even more because like he he runs everything. Like that guy runs a lot of events and he doesn't have to support those games, like all of them, but he does because he wants to grow our gaming community and like today, he had a full house with, there was a Pokemon release. He also, at the same time, even though it was slam packed, we did our Guild Ball League there. He also had some Star Wars Destiny going on. There were guys playing arcade in the back. So this guy goes out of his way. So, I mean, if you're looking for a good game shop in Charleston, I mean, he's the place to go. Even though it's not the biggest store, he accommodates for everybody. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And last thing before we get our final sign off here is just remember to visit Rage Quit Wire on the Twitter machine. Uh, like I said, I, I post all the time. I, I'm replying to people, answering questions, asking questions. 
and we're just we're we're excited to have this thing off and running. And I'll definitely chime in and talk some shit and post. post yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get him to post more on the Twitter machine. I'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm so, not that type of Asian. What does that mean? Like the the techie Asian. So what kind of Asian are you? The food kind. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's it for this episode of Rage Quit Wire. We're out.